Well, this is our second session on the origin of evil, part two. We could call it cosmic warfare, if you like. But before we get into this, I would like to ex re-examine what we think of as reality. We're going to explore the spirit world, and most of us tend to think of that in terms of cliches, because we don't see it, feel it, understand it. I think it'll be useful for us to try to stand back a little bit and get a perspective of what we think of as reality. And we'll use our springboard, verse 12 of chapter 6 of Ephesians, where Paul tells us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's scary stuff if you realize what it's saying. We're not against flesh and blood. You and I can relate to that. We're talking here a whole list of things that are actually ranks of angels, fallen angels at that, and some of them are demons. We take the view that fallen angels and demons are not the same thing. Fallen angels are vastly more powerful. They can materialize. They can engage in combat, among other things. Demons are powerless except to the extent they can influence, possess, and guide, and they seem to be very desperate for embodiment. But be that as it may, well, that's the details of that for a subject for another time. Let's talk about the boundaries of reality. Let's take puny man and put him right in the middle. If we take size as increasing to the right here, the cosmos is the exploration of things bigger than ourselves. That leads us into studies of largeness, the universe itself. That leads to astronomy, astrophysics, those kinds of things. And the great discovery of 20th century of science is it's finite. It has a limit. That the cosmos is limited. It's not infinite. The universe has a finite limit. It might be expanding, yes, maybe, but it's finite, not infinite. Big discovery, profoundly significant. We're going to look at the other direction for a little bit, towards smallness. In fact, we get so small, we'll be talking about hyperspaces. That's a fancy word for meaning spaces of more than three dimensions. We think of three spatial dimensions. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we're really going to explore the limits of smallness. Did you realize there's a limit to smallness? Most of us think we can make something, whatever we've got that's small, we can cut in half and make it even smaller. Not true. This leads into the area of what's called quantum physics, subatomic particles and the like. We discover, shockingly, that the universe that we know, the physical world that we know, is made up of units that are indivisible. You can't split them up. You can't, make, can't get smaller. And the implications of that are staggering. There are quantum physicists that committed suicide as they came to grips with what the implications that are. Let's back up for a minute. And let's talk about the smallest thing you and I have the capacity to imagine, and that's an atom. We've all had atomic uh, sketches in school. We think of an atom, the simplest one would be the hydrogen atom. It has a nucleus. Around that nucleus is orbiting, apparently, an electron. Okay? So we have a nucleus in the middle and electrons spinning around it. This is not to scale, but I do want to get across to you what the scale would have to be to make this legitimate. We know that the nucleus is about 10 to the, excuse me, yeah, 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. The atom itself has a, 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 a radius of, or a diameter, I think, a diameter of 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Now you say, well, I can't relate to those small numbers. You don't need to. You just look at the ratio of them. In other words, if, if the atom is 10 to the minus 8 and the nucleus is 10 to the minus 13, that means then that the ratio of those is... 100,000 to 1. See, in other words, 13 to the 8, that's the number of zeros. So you 10 to the minus 8 is point zero 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 zero. you know, 8 of those zeros, point one, and, and the other one is 13. So the difference between those two is, one is, is 5. You take the difference. You, in, exp ex in exponents, you take the difference. You with me? Okay. So the ratio of those is 10 to the 5th. 100,000 to 1. The atom is 100,000 times in radius or diameter, either way, of the nucleus. 
Now that's linear. If we're going to do a two-dimensional diagram, you've got to square that. It's square feet in area, right? If you're going to do it in volume, it's cubed. It's 10 to the 5th by 10 to the 5th times 10 to the 5th. In other words, your 10 to the 5th has to be, if you're going to go volumetrically, that's cubed, right? If I have a, a foot length in area that would be a one square foot, foot by foot, if it's cubically, it's a foot by foot by foot, right? If it's three, if it's a yard or it's three feet, square it would be three by three, right? Nine square feet. That's 27 cubic feet in a cube. Are you with me? You're cubic. Well, so volumetrically, the volume of, of material there is one part in 10 to the 15th. Well, what does that mean? Okay, that is a ratio of one second to 30 million years. 10 to the 15th is a mathematical way of expressing a very large number. One second to 30 million years. Let me give you a practical example of this. I have a podium here, okay? And if I said that this is solid, boy, it sure feels solid. That's my podium, right? Is this solid? I say it's solid. Mary over here says, you're all f washed up. There's nothing here. She is more right than I am by that ratio. Is this all really just empty space? If she maintains this empty space and I say it's solid, conjecture number two is more descriptive than, than number one by that same ratio. The ratio of one second to 30 million years is 10 to the 15th. What's my point? This world that we think of as being real is a simulation. It turns out to be an electrical simulation. It pretends to be real. It feels real because the orbits of the electrons and the atoms of my hand are colliding with the orbits of the electrons that make up the... It, it feels solid. It sounds solid. All those physical attributes do occur, but they result, they come from an electronic simi... We, you and I, are in a virtual environment. Let's go look at this a little further. We discover in modern science that everything we know is made up of indivisible units, units that cannot be divided, whether you're talking about mass, energy, length, space, what have you. If I take a line of anything, let's just imagine I take a line here, I can obviously cut that line in half, can I? I can take the half and take it, and I can cut it in half, right? And whatever I have left, I can cut that in half. And you'd think that I could do that forever. I might get so small, I'm just dealing conceptually. But whatever I've got left, you think, well, no matter how small it is, I can cut it in half. It turns out that's not true. One of the shocking discoveries in science is you get to a point where if you try to divide it again, it loses a very interesting property. It loses a property the physicists called locality. It suddenly becomes everywhere at the same moment. It loses locality. Now you and I can't deal with that. But it turns out that that's called the plaque length. In length it happens to be 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. If I, get, if I get down to 10 to the minus 30, that's very, very tiny, but if I get down that small and try to divide it, it's everywhere at once. They've discovered that every photon in the universe knows what every other photon is doing right now, immediately. There's no transmittal. Ooh, what's that mean? There's a thing called Planck time. There's a period of time that you cannot divide any further. The shortest period of time is 10 to the minus 43 seconds. That's called Planck time. It'll just take a second. Okay, you got 10 to the 43 zeros Planck times left. That's a lot. No, it's a very small unit of time. I believe that's the, the uh, twinkle of an eye, by the way, in the Bible. So the point is, there is a limit to smallness. And that's a shocker. At the macrocosm, we know we're limited. The universe is finite. In the microcosm, it's finite. That has staggering implications for every one of us. We have a universe that is, has finite limits at both ends. It can't get any bigger, and you can't get smaller than these units. So that means we are in a simulation, and we are in a digital simulation. These are not, there's no such thing, truly, as analog units. They're digital. 
They are made up of indivisible elements. Scientists have, been, have come, become concerned that the constants of physics appear to be changing. And there was an article in Scientific American back in uh, June of 2005 on the subject. But the conclusion, the reason scientists are so concerned about the fact certain constants may be changing is because if they are, and they apparently are, it implies that our, their words, not mine, our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. Wow. Just because the constants aren't constant, they come to this conclusion, it turns out. That's what the Bible has said all along in Hebrews 11.3, 1 Corinthians 15, and elsewhere. Let's take a look at what Paul said to the Ephesians in chapter 3. He's speaking, he's speaking about Christ dwelling in your hearts. He said that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is that breadth, length, depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Okay, he's making his point, but whoops, did you notice what he did along the way? That comprehend with all saints what is that breadth and length and depth and height. Paul, whether he rep knew it consciously or it was just the Holy Spirit, there are four dimensions in the universe. Einstein's theory of relativity is the great discovery of 20th century science, discovering that we live in four-dimensional space, not three. Three spatial dimensions and time. It's a physical property. You need to understand that if you're going to understand your Bible. We've just gone beyond Euclid. You and I had Euclidean geometry when we were in school. But in 1854, George Riemann introduced metric tensors. It took 60 years before people could apply that. It took 60 years for Einstein to use those, that mathematics to develop four-dimensional space-time. And he went to his death frustrated because he couldn't go further. He couldn't reconcile certain things that Clues and Klein in 53 did, doing exactly what Einstein did, go adding one dimension. And, and they reconciled light and supergravity, and Yang Mills went in 63, uh, a decade later, and, and reconciled uh, electromagnetic and both nuclear. So the four main forces are now reconciled, at least in part. Since 1984, most thinkers in this region of uh, quantum physics believe in ten-dimensional superstrings, that we live in ten dimensions. And I think that happens, I'm not trying to get you into the mathematics, except to point out that Nachmanides, a Hebrew sage in the 13th century, by studying the text of Genesis, came to the conclusion that our, our universe has ten dimensions. Four of them are directly knowable, six are not knowable. And he published that, to that effect. And now in modern, the 20th century physics, the particle physicists have discovered that we live in ten dimensions. Four of them are directly measurable, three spatial dimensions in time, and one of them, or I should say six of them, are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, and thus are inferable only indirectly because they're smaller than the wavelength of light. So the point is, we've spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover what Nachmanides discovered by reading the text. I think that's kind of fun. But let's shift gears now, having perhaps humbled ourselves a little bit about our perceptions of reality, what is really real. We read in the Bible the spiritual world. We tend to think of this is the real world. The spiritual world is this fuzzy, fuzzy thing out there. No, it's the other way around. The spiritual world is the real world. We are in a special subset of it. That's the point. We get a few glimpses of that in the Scripture. And let's explore Daniel 10. It's a very illuminating preamble to a couple of chapters that we're going to pass on. We're just interested in the preamble here. We're going to get a glimpse of what I'll call the dark side, okay? Okay, it's Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name is called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. So this is the first year of King Cyrus, Daniel's third year out of public life. He's retired. This is two years after the Jews have been allowed under Cyrus to return to the land. So we're now several years after the time of Ezekiel. Uh, they were roughly contemporaneous, and uh, about two years after the return. By only, only about less than 50,000 actually took advantage of Cyrus's decree to return and, uh, under Ezra and then later Nehemiah and all of that. But, okay, so the exiles had just returned from Babylon and had begun building the temple. Daniel was still there in Babylon. Probably he didn't return because his, Isaiah, he was over 80 years old and he had it made there. He's number third ruler in the Persian Empire. Uh, 
he was taken care of pretty well, I guess. In those days, I, Daniel, he says, was mourning three full weeks. I want you to notice that. How long was he uh, fasting and praying here? Three weeks. I was in mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. Neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. That's quite a while. That's a serious fast. And it's an absolute fast, huh? Almost absolute fast. And the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is the Hittichel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Uphaz. His body was also like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, and my comeliness was turned into me corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he would spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Got the picture so far. Daniel's been praying and fasting for three weeks. How long is three weeks? How many days? Twenty-one days. Let's call it that for good reason. And he has this visitor, some kind of super guy here. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. In other words, his visitor was dispatched to see him the day he started praying and fasting. And he was sent specifically to give Daniel a message. That was 21 days ago. But then he explains what the problem is. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. The prince of the kingdom of Persia. That's not Cyrus. That's the power behind Persia, we'll discover. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. In other words, he was trying to, he was dispatched, trying to get through to Daniel, and this obstacle, this adversary, distracted him, kept him, fought with him, whatever. He withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Here's a messenger. He's been specifically dispatched to communicate to Daniel when Daniel asked for him. He prayed for him, been fasting, he's trying to get through. He's withstood, whatever that means, that this dark presence has obstructed him until, Dan until Michael shows up to help him. Michael is one of the two angels that have names and jobs. Lots of angels, I'm sure. Gabriel is always an announcer of something messianic. Whether you see him in the Old Testament or the New, he's always bringing an announcement about the Messiah. That seems to be his primary job. Michael is a military guy. He is always at war on behalf of God's people. Well, here, this messenger is trying to get through to Daniel. Some creature by the, called here the prince of the power of the kingdom of Persia is obstructing him until Michael comes and aids him. Good. So he apparently got through because here he is, right? He continues here. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people. Daniel's people is what? The Jews there, right? What shall befall thy people in the latter days. For the, yet the vision is for many days. He's got a message for them. That message is chapter 11 and 12 that follows, the climax of the book of Daniel. Chapter 11 and 12 is very rich, full of prophecy. People often talk about the silent years between the Testaments, 
The last book of the Old Testament, we have it as Malachi. There's 400 years before the New Testament starts, and many people call those the silent years because they haven't done their homework. Those years are in the Scripture. They're prophetically included from in chapter 11, verse 5 to verse 35 of chapter 11, summarize those 400 years, interestingly enough. And chapter 11 and 12 are so important that chapter 10 is really just the warm-up. It's just the, 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 the preamble. But in this preamble, the messenger that's going to give Daniel 11 and 12 is held up for 21 days until Michael comes along to help him. That's what I want to get a picture of here. Let's get a little more here. He was to me one in 20 days. Now, Michael's the chief prince. He's a, he's a heavy dude. He's a military guy. His strength is in Exodus and Isaiah all the way through. And in fact, Michael even takes on Satan. He fights Satan for the body of Moses in Jude 9. And I believe it's Michael's voice that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians 4, the voice of the archangel. Michael, Michael apparently is the archangel. And there's a big mystery behind all this. Why was Moses' body an issue? God buried Moses personally, Scripture says, and yet Michael has to fight Satan over his body? What is it? I thought the body's going to rot, and I mean, what, what, what do we need the body for? We're going to have resurrection bodies, aren't we? Well, apparently... Moses' body is needed because it shows up in Matthew 17 of the Transfiguration, and it shows up, I believe, in, Matthew, in uh, Revelation chapter 11. Both Moses and Elijah have a special role yet in the body. And so, but one of the things as we, we, we beside Michael, is another issue here. What do you suppose would have happened if Daniel's fast was turned off after the 19th day? He didn't go 21 days. He started fasting, and he fasted for... 18, 19, and huh, enough's enough. You know, we don't, it doesn't say this, but we sort of presume that the 21 days of fasting had something to do with this angel taking 21 days to fight through his resistance. The angel that's talking to, that's going to give him chapter 11, 12, had to fight through, and it took him 21 days to get through. You can't resist the presumption that, Matthew, that uh, Daniel's fasting and praying was what got him through. Doesn't say that, but it certainly suggests that. In fact, the messenger goes on to talk here a little bit. He says, And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I, the Daniel, Daniel speaking, When he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. And when I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O oh my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can a servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. And said, O oh man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto thee, and be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken to me, I was strengthened, and he said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But... I will show thee that which is noted in the Scripture of Truth, that there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. I'm come, therefore I've come unto thee. Now will I return to fight the prince of Persia, the guy that's been holding up. He's got to go back and deal with him. And when, I, when, and when I'm gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. Well, you get the impression that behind the Persian Empire was a spirit being, or beings, plural maybe, that are behind it, that he's fighting with, and when he's through with them, the next empire that rises up is Greeks. The Greeks conquer the Persians. Two hundred years later. But the picture, there's just a glimpse we get here, because what, what happens here, of course, chapter 10 becomes 11 and 12, and, and we're not going to get into all that here. This is just a prelude to, chapter, to Daniel 11 and 12. But we've just gotten a glimpse here. You get the impression that behind these big empires is a spirit, spiritual conflict going on. And uh, that getting messages to us requires resources 
in that spirit world to get through to us, and that's somehow linked to our praying and fasting. Let's get it. We have another glimpse that's worth taking a look at in uh, 2 Kings 6. I love this one. It's kind of fun. 2 Kings eight, uh, 6, starting at verse 8, the king of Syria warred against Israel. You got the, you got the Syrians, you got Israel. The king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God, a prophet, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Here's a situation that doesn't occur just once, many times, apparently. The king of Syria is making his plans, and he's going to set up a situation, his camp in a certain place. And the prophet of God sends an email, maybe it's an email, huh, to, the, uh, 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 to his benefactor, the king of Israel, saying, by the way, watch it, there's an ambush being set up. That happens so often, the king of Syria is getting upset. In verse 10, the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, the, and saved him there, not once or twice. In other words, this happens again and again and again is the point. And therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was more t- so troubled for this thing. And he called his servant and said to them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He assumes he's got a mole on a staff. He has these meetings, he makes these plans, and the king of Israel somehow always knows. This is the first recorded uh, case of telephone taps. So he thinks he's got a spy in his own entourage here. One of his servants said, None, none, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. So that's the, you know, that, that, that's the explanation that he gives the king of Syria. He said, Go and spy where he is, that is where Elisha is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, Well, he's, behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses, chariots, tanks, bazooka, no, and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city round about. So the king of Syria realizes that his weak link is somehow this prophet of Israel. So he's going to go after the prophet of Israel. So he circled, he has his forces, circled Dothan overnight. Now I love this morning, get this morning event. When the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. Got up early in the morning, looks out the window or whatever. Uh-oh. The whole gang are surrounded. The servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And Elisha says, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I assume the servant just wasn't in the mood for some, you know, glib cliché. He can hear them revving their engines out there, okay? And so he's nervous and frightened. And I visualize Elisha here being very um, patient, but sort of at the end of his wits in a way. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Interesting. We have no idea what's surrounding us. Elisha knew the young man did not. Lord, show him. Show him. Give him a break. Show him what. So he does. Uh, Now, Satan, his origin, his agenda, and his destiny. Quick snapshot. It's interesting that Satan is always addressed indirectly. Not always. Most of the time it's indirect, indirectly. Even God... In Genesis 3.15, we saw him addressed indirectly in Isaiah 14, Matthew 16, and other places. He is our accuser. Remember Job 1, the whole saga of Job is a result of, of an accusation. And uh, apparently Satan has access to the throne of God for that purpose. He's a tempter. We saw that when we opened up our series in uh, on, on Luke chapter 4. 
There's a summary of all of this in Revelation 12. We have the woman with the sun and the moon and stars at her feet. She's with child. We have the red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns who's trying to devour the man-child as soon as he's born. We have the man-child himself who's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron and he's caught up to God in his throne. The woman then flees into the wilderness for 1260 days. We have Michael and his angels who fights the dragon and his angels. And uh, then the dragon is cast to the earth, and he persecutes the woman for three and a half years, and so on. Very summary, one of his overall wrap-up summaries in Revelation 12. Who is the woman? The woman's not the church. Some people think she's the church. If she's the church, she's in bad company because she's pregnant. No, the church is the virgin bride. No, this woman is Israel in the sense that it began with Eve, the messianic line. The sun, moon, and stars. Jacob himself interprets who she is by, from the dream that, that Joseph had. She's with child. Church didn't bring forth Jesus Christ. Israel did. Had the, 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 we celebrated every Christmas, the man-child. The adversary is the red dragon here. Seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns. And who is that? In verse 9 of chapter 12, he's identified for you. He's the serpent, the devil, Satan. And he's trying to, he tries to destroy the man-child the moment he's born. The murderer of the innocents in Bethlehem and so on. The man, who's the man-child? The kinsman redeemer. The Messiah. Hamashiach. He's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That's used all through the scripture that way, Old and New Testament. But he's caught up to God in his throne. I believe it was G.H. Pember that first suggested that particular event may not just be limited to the ascension. It may include the harpazo, the rapture. Well, that's just one person. Yeah, so is the body of Christ, one person. And then the woman flees into the wilderness, 12, 1260 days, and so forth. And Michael's angels come and fight the dragon. Finally, the dragon's cast to the earth, persecutes the woman, and so forth. See, God expelled Satan from the mount of God, we learn in Ezekiel uh, 28. That is in heaven, the, the mountain, the, 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 the organization, the, the government of God. Satan was cast from God's government in heaven, but he still is allowed access to God to accuse. We see that in Job 1 and Zechariah 3 and elsewhere. In the tribulation, Satan will be cast from heaven and restricted to the earth. It's going to be a climactic time. From the harpazo till the wrap-up, he's got a short window of opportunity. He's going to have to move and move fast when that happens. During the millennium, he's going to be chained, incarcerated. Man will be without excuse for a thousand years. Satan's bound. You can't blame it on him. He'll be in the bottomless pit. I believe that's geocentric. After a brief release at the end of the millennium, he'll be cast in the lake of fire forever. So his destiny is sealed. That's the scenario. But it has a beginning in that gap between verse 1 and 2 of Genesis 1. What are his strategies during this interval now? Well, he tried to corrupt Adam's line. He knew that when, when, as God reveals his plans, he revealed that the, both heaven and earth are going to be redeemed by a man from the line of Adam. So Satan's attack is on Adam's line. In Genesis 4 as well as Genesis 6, but definitely Genesis 6, that's what led to the flood. But as God focuses his reveals his plan in a little more detail. It's going to come through Abraham. Then suddenly Abraham's seed are a primary target of Satan. In Genesis 12 and 20 and elsewhere. The famine in Genesis 50 and so on. The destruction of the male line in Exodus 1. But, you know, Moses is, is miraculously salvaged and so on. Pharaoh's pursuit, even after he reveals them, he goes after them in Exodus 14, after the Passover. All of these are attempts by Satan to wipe out, to thwart God's plan. As God reveals his plan, it allows Satan to focus his energies. When God tells Abraham that after 400 years, his descendants are going to come back here to the land of Canaan, that gave Satan four centuries to lay down a minefield. And that's why the Nephilim and all of that were replanted there again. And that's why Joshua was told to wipe out every man, woman, and child of four, four key tribes, because there was a gene pool problem there. And then as God further refines his, explains that he's going to do it through the line of David, that makes David's line a special target of Satan. Satan's able to focus the attack as God incrementally reveals his plans in, in, uh, in 2 Samuel 7 and so on. In David's line, 
Jerome kills all his brothers except one. The Arabians slew them all but Ahaziah. Athaliah kills all, but Joash gets. There's always a little miraculous child or what have you that thwarts Satan's attempt to wipe out the messianic line. That's what Haman was all about in the days of Persia. Hezekiah is assaulted and all that. Haman's attempts in Persia and Esther is well known and, and worth your attention. This doesn't end in the Old Testament. New Testament, Joseph's fears with Mary are, fit, are, are fatal if you'd follow the law. Herod's attempts to wipe out the babes in Bethlehem, trying to throw Jesus at, at the synagogue of Nazareth when he announces his ministry. They try to throw him off a cliff. And there are the storms at sea. There were two of them. And I don't think they were natural storms. These were fishermen who were used to fishing on those waters. And they were terrified for their lives. No, those weren't just tough storms. Those, I believe, that's why Jesus rebukes the wind. I think they were supernaturally in their origin. And of course, the ultimate one is the cross. The cross. And we have that summary in Revelation 12 that I just went through. And he's not through yet. He's still at it. And we need to understand what his agenda is and what his resources, because he's not through. And you and I are both the pawns and the prize in this drama. His titles remind you, he's the prince of this world, we said. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the head of the world ruler. You know, and it's a shock to realize how in step and how managed our diverse media is. You'd think there was competition. No, they are in lockstep to his march, whether they realize it or not. Head of the world, rulers of darkness. He's the god of this age. Ooh. What's our present predicament? Let's take a step back. America is in moral freefall. Have you noticed? You and I are victims, not of the Democrats or the liberals, what have you. No, no, no. We're victims of spiritual warfare. We have a media that's masking truth, that's hide, going out of its way to hide from you the truth of things that you need to know to survive. We have courts without justice, corruption everywhere. We have anger that replaces what used to be patriotism. Our schools are deliberately dumbing down our youth. Goals 2001 are deliberate attempts to, to have a malleable electorate. They are deliberately dumbing down and teaching lies in our schools, because we let them. We've replaced our traditional heritage that we were founded on with multiculturalism, revisionism, and values relativism. It used to be that even the simplest peasant in this country, sending his kids to college, had the dream that at least they'd learn right from wrong. How ironic it is that our colleges deny the existence of right and wrong. Our government is now the purveyor of immorality. Have you noticed that? I'll come to you. I'll tell you why in a minute. Why should we be surprised? Governments have always loved crises. They provide the rationale for increased budgets and bureaucracies and subjugating the population. Crises do. Most new dictators create external crises to consolidate their internal powers, called wars. In our country, we long ago learned that social crises serve as well as military ones. And there's an insight that you need to have that supplies the missing link. Immorality results in social crises. Is it any surprise to learn that governments have an enormous incentive to promote immorality? Let me diagram this for you. Governments love military crises because they lead to budgets and bureaucracies and a curtailment of our freedoms. Okay. In our country, we've learned something very useful. You don't have to have a military crisis. Social crises work just as well. A war on poverty, a war on terror, you know, whatever. Save the environment, you name it. What creates social crises? Immorality. The pill in 1960, boy, did that change our morality, right? Roe versus Wade. Where's the most dangerous place for an American to be? In the womb of the mother. One chance in four of being murdered. Immorality creates social crises. That's why we have one-parent families and all the other aspects of that. Okay. Well, if governments benefit from social crises and immorality calls social crises, is it any surprise that government has an incentive to, cr to promote immorality? No wonder they're promoting homosexuality and it's 
the, 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 you know, the uh, sodomist lifestyle. And on it goes. Increasing government, increasing morality, increasing social crisis, which in, and you're on that self-feeding spiral. That's one of the many reasons that our founding fathers tried to avoid us having a democracy. A democracy is mob rule. We had at one time a republic which has democratic features but has safeguards. Separation of powers, due process of law, and a lot of other issues. Well, what is our resource then? Individually, the armor of God. The armor of God. Paul, starting in verse 10, says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Not your might, His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The whole armor, not just your favorite pieces. The whole armor. Why? Here's our threat assessment right here. We started off with that in this whole session. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor. There he says it a second time. Take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. That's your first, that's your belt. That's the thing upon which everything else depends and hangs on. Having your loins girt about with truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Not your righteousness, his righteousness. Now a lot of people always assume that Paul is drawing these idioms from the, the uh, Praetorian guard that's chained to him. That as he looks at him, he's sort of using that as his model. No, he's quoting this from the Old Testament. Everybody likes to build that model. It's not true. The, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the Spirit, all, virtually all these idioms are traceable quotes from the Old Testament. But let's keep, the, we'll just stay on the track here. Mm -hmm. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate is critical. That's life-threatening. You, you can lose other, you can get other kinds of wounds. You don't want a wound that the breastplate protects you against. So you need to be sure of your security. Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Feet shod with the preparation. You know, if you've taken any martial arts, or if you had any um, um, uh, wrestling or boxing, you know the importance of footwork. Uh, at the academy, Naval Academy, you have a year of, uh, of uh, for the first several years, you have a year of boxing, a year of wrestling as part of the program, and uh, then you get, that all comes together later in hand-to-hand. -hand. But um, I happen to hate boxing. I just don't like boxing. I just, some people, I just don't like it. Fortunately, I happen to have kind of a long reach. So I didn't get in too much trouble. But I used to hate that. But the one thing you really learn is footwork. Heel to toe, the whole thing. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Very, very graphic. If you're going to be in combat, you better be prepared. Above all, taking the shield of faith The Roman soldiers had a shield, and they would spend their time making sure it was in repair. They didn't wait for the battle to plug the holes. If it had a problem from a previous engagement, they would fix that right away. Well, are there holes in your shield of faith? Are there problem areas that bother you? Fix them now. Double back on those. Get the answers you need. If there's a hole that needs repair, do it now. Don't wait until you're in the battle, because you're in the battle right now. You're on enemy territory as it stands. The Bible taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. You want that to be bulletproof. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. You, there again, you need to know your ground. You need to know the three tenses of salvation. The past tense called justification, the present tense called sanctification, and the future tense called glorification. Do, you, do your homework. Find out about that. And just owning a helmet isn't any good. You've got to be wearing it. You can tell the ones who aren't wearing it by the bandages. 
Uh, and here's the one that we all know and love, the sword of the Spirit. Every one of us know that's the Word of God. That's the only offensive weapon you have. Everything else listed is defensive. Your shield, your helmet, and so forth. The sword is two-edged. It is, it is um, uh, your, your offensive weapon. The sword of the Spirit. It's interesting, the technology of those days, uh, early centuries, seemed to favor a long curved sword. Most armies were equipped with a long sword. The Roman army did something rather different. They developed the machaira, 24 inches, short, double-edged sword. And with that short sword, they conquered the world. But there's two things you need to know about the machaira. You had to know how to use it, and you had to practice, 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 practice. Because it was for, the whole idea was to close in close. And uh, same thing's true with the Word of God. It doesn't do any good, your Bible doesn't do any good if it's getting dust on your bookshelf. You've got to be in it every day. And just knowing your Bible ain't enough. You've got to put it into practice. You've got to know where to go to find what you're looking for. And you've got to be able to present the message that God has given you to present. So it takes practice, practice, practice in execution. And everybody talks about uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 17, the armor of God, and everybody misses the most important one. I've seen lists from Ephesians 6 that do not include verse 18. And that's stupid. I'm sorry I can't be more hospitable. Because this is your heavy artillery. This is your weapon for action at a distance. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Wow! And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You can participate in helping the Christians that are being uh, uh, assassinated in the Sudan. And you can do that without getting an airplane ticket. You can do that in your living room or in your bedroom by kneeling by your bedside and praying for them. Everybody's upset about the election right now. There's all kinds of concerns. Let me tell you, your prayer closet is more powerful than our ballot boxes. Praying always, Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And I want you to notice what Paul prays for. Praying always, yes, and for me. Pray for me, he says. I want you to pray for me, gang. It is a warfare. Pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly. <laughs> Can you imagine Paul asking for boldness? I'm always amused as I visualize him writing this thing. He's got a Praetorian guard chained to him. You know why? So the guard couldn't get away. Can you imagine being chained to Paul for a full shift? <laughs> Remember what Woody Allen said, he, his, his definition of hell was to be stuck in an elevator with a life insurance salesman. <laughs> a cute little sound bite, but can you imagine being chained to Paul? Not, and, and many of them came to faith. We, we learned that from the epistles. The household of faith is, refers to the Praetorians. And that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. That's Paul talking. He's praying for boldness. You've got to be kidding. But praise God for Paul, that I may open my mouth boldly. Well, we've been talking a lot about Satan and dark things. Let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about not Satan, but our guy. I love this. This is one of my favorite physics verses in the Bible. It's a physics verse. John, 1 John 3, 2. John says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, you can draw a lot of inferences from that that are per perfectly legitimate and appropriate, but I don't think you can fully understand what he's saying unless you have a background in advanced math or physics. And what I mean by that is, what he's saying here does not yet appear what we shall be. He's talking about the resurrection body. We don't quite understand what it's all about. We know we're the sons of God. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He, Christ, shall appear, we shall be like Him because 
we shall see him as he is. If I had a camera here and I took a picture of you, you're a three-dimensional being and I end up with a two-dimensional representation of you. If I have a hologram, I can get a three-dimensional representation of you, but I can best see you by also being a three-dimensional being with you. Now the question that people speculate, how many dimensions does Christ have? We know he has more than four. More than three for sure, he goes through walls and all that stuff. More than th for a lot of reasons, if you're into that kind of analysis, most people that get into that seriously come to the conclusion he has to have had at least eleven dimensions. But whatever it is, don't speculate. We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. Why? For we shall see him as he is. What that's saying to me is that whatever dimensionality he presently enjoys, we will too. I'm not saying we're going to be equal to them. Don't misunderstand me. But I think we will be able to comprehend him because we will be, in that sense, like him. Exciting. Exciting stuff. We know that he shall appear. We shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And what's he really up to? See, our writer of Hebrews, where I believe is Paul, he quotes Psalm 8, verse 5, Thou madest him for a little while lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. See, Adam through sin forfeited his dominion to Satan. But did he ever have dominion over the angels? No. Thou crownest him, this last Adam, with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands, which include the angels. The last Adam gained dominion over everything. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Not quite yet. Because it goes on here. There's some unfinished business that remains. Eventually, you and I are going to be joint heirs with him, aren't we? That's exactly what Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 15. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so Christ shall, in Christ shall all be made alive. Every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. Afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till death hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Delivered up the kingdom. There we started with the kingdom, here we are again. For he hath put all things under his feet, but he's, when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that is, he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him that God may be what? All in all. That's the goal. The astonishing discovery is that's going to take Christ a thousand years to get it in that shape. Wow. Interesting. Well, Paul also, I can't, I can never resist. I want to get away from Satan and all the stuff we've been talking about, leave on a higher note here. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who, who maketh intercession for us? And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall di tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? Nay, it is, as it is written, for thy sake we are Killed all day long, all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers. There they are again, aren't they? Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, we've been talking about kingship. I'm going to just wrap it up by talking about our king. As most of you know, I'm not a Republican nor a Democrat. I'm a monarchist. I want to tell you about my candidate. He's a king of the Jews. Yes, he is going to play the racial card here. He's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's a national king. Wow. My king is a racial king. My king is a national king. He's the king of all the ages, the king of heaven, the king of glory, and king of kings, and lord of lords. 
And the real issue for each of us, do you know him? Do you really know him? He was a prophet before Moses, a priest after Melchizedek, a champion like Joshua, an offering in the place of Isaac, a king from the line of David, a wise counselor above Solomon. He was beloved, rejected, and then exalted son like Joseph, but yet far more. The heavens declare his glory, the firmament shows his handiwork, he who is, who was, and always will be, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, the Alpha and the Tau, the A and the Z. Yes, he was the first fruits of them that slept. He's the Ego I me, the Ichyach Asher Ichyach, the I am that I am. He was the voice of the burning bush. Yes, he was the captain of the Lord's host. He was the conqueror of Jericho, despite what the music says. He's enduringly strong, entirely sincere, eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful, impar imperially powerful, impartially merciful. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the very God of very God. He's our kinsman redeemer, but he's also our avenger of blood. He's our city of refuge. He's our performing high priest, our personal prophet, our reigning king. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of theology. He's the supreme problem in higher criticism. He's the miracle of all the ages, the superlative of everything good. We, you and I are the beneficiaries of a love letter. It was written in blood on a wooden cross, erected in Judea some 2,000 years ago. He was crucified on a cross of wood, and yet he made the hill on which it stood. By him were all things made that were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. By him are all things held together. Question, what held him to that cross? It wasn't the nails. At any time you could have said, enough already, I am out of here. What held him to that cross? It was his love for you and me. He was born of a woman so you and I could be born again. He humbled himself so that we could be lifted up. He became a servant so that we could be joint heirs with him. He suffered rejection so that we could become his friends. He denied himself so that he, we could freely receive all things. He gave himself so that he could bless us in every way. He's available to the tempted and tried. He blesses the young. He cleanses the lepers. He defends the feeble. He delivers the captives. He discharges the debtors. He forgives the sinners. He franchises the meek, he guards the besieged, he heals the sick, he provides strength to the weak, he regards the aged, he rewards the diligent, he sympathizes, and he saves. His offices are manifold. His reign is righteous. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His light is matchless. His grace is sufficient. His love never changes. His mercy is everlasting. His word is enough. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. <laughs> he's indescribable, he's incomprehensible, he's irresistible, he's invincible. The heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Man cannot explain him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but soon learned they couldn't stop him. The personal representative of the ruler of the world could not find fault with him. The witnesses could not agree against him. Herod couldn't kill him, the death couldn't handle him, the grave couldn't hold him. He's always been and always will be. He had no predecessor and he will have no successor. You can't impeach him and he ain't going to resign. His name is above every name that at the name of Yeshua every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. His is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.